This is everything you need to know if you want to get a good paying job as a newbie front end software developer. This is the list that I wish someone had shared with me when I first started out. And these are the same core skills that I use on a day to day basis working as a front end software engineer at Adobe. Number one, HTML. You need to understand the document object model or DOM how to structure a basic index HTML page. Everything starts with that page, but it's blank until you actually do something and put stuff in it. For example, you gotta know the common HTML tags and how to use them. This is going to include the body tag, div, image, link, order list, unordered list, list items, and there's a bunch of other elements. And you're gonna need to learn about semantic HTML and why you should use it. These HTML tags provide additional meaning to the structure of your HTML. For example, section, article, header, aside, tell you more about the contents of the tag than the plain old div. With the div, you have no idea what's inside. We find and interact with tags using HTML attributes. When you see an ID, a class, data, aria, for, type, name, value, or similar words inside of an HTML tag, and it's followed by an equal sign and then something that is wrapped in quotes, you're looking at an attribute. The script tag is important because it's how we actually load JavaScript onto the page. And without JavaScript, our application or website is just going to be extremely boring and not super helpful. The link tag is going to let us include external resources in our document, like adding CSS styling. Number two, cascading style sheets, also known as CSS. It's not enough to just link CSS style sheets. We also need a way to reference specific elements in the HTML that we want to stylize. The most common way to do this is by adding class names from a style sheet onto the class attribute of an HTML element. But that's just one of the ways to do it. You need to understand why it's usually a better idea to use classes instead of IDs in CSS. And you're gonna have to prevent one style from colliding with other styles. And the way to control this is through a concept called specificity. Mm -hmm. Throwing important around all over the place is just a really bad idea. We use CSS selectors to target specific elements based on their location in the DOM in relation to other elements. For example, child, sibling, descendant, last child, attribute selectors, and there's quite a few of them out there to learn. You control the actual styling through CSS properties, which are the bread and butter of making things look good. Only it's kind of like honey butter mixed with broken seashells. Just when you start to think it's cool, you realize it's also painful. There are a ton of ways to influence the size of the elements. You can set the height, the width, there's min heights, min widths. You can do stuff with line heights. You can make stuff shrink or go completely off the page. And the spacing around all of these elements is controlled with margins and padding. But there are some gotchas here. For example, you need to know that margins can collapse. It's important to understand how these interact and affect each other and the overall size of the element. Do you want the header to stick to the top of the page while you scroll or have some part of your HTML take up a certain amount of space or even move it off the page? This is handled with static, relative, absolute, or fixed positioning. Flexbox and Grid are really important to know and they kind of overlap with some of the stuff that we just talked about. And these and their related properties help make layouts that can grow and shrink and that are aligned with each other, right? Have spacing between them, around them. There's a lot you can do with Flexbox. Before Flexbox, there were floats. It's good to know about floats because you're likely to encounter them, but it's even better if you can avoid using them. They're like fleas, you know, they're around you. You just don't know where they've bounced off to. Minimalist black and white sites can be really attractive, but sometimes you just gotta add a little bit of color. And there are CSS properties for adding color to backgrounds, to text, borders, and even pseudo elements. There are also a ton of ways to style text, links, and images. You need to know how to handle when content over flows it's allowed space what happens when content is too big for the space it's in do you hide it do you make it scrollable do you say to heck with pixel perfect and let it just completely run off the page and annoy the designers if you have a bunch of stuff that's overlapping which one should be on top you control this with something called z index now the higher the z index the more likely it is to be on top so z index of 10,000 should just about do it Okay, you really need to learn how to avoid this Z index race to gigantic numbers. Is your web application going to be used in a laptop browser or is it also going to be used on your phone? Do you want your app to be responsive and change depending on the size of the screen so that a user doesn't have to fat finger tiny buttons on their phone? 
we use media queries to control rules for the different sizes of screens and device types. Or maybe you wanna spice up your site and have menus that slide in and slide out rather than just pop in and pop out. And there are CSS properties for doing these kind of animations. One of the challenges with updating the color of a website is that you might have to make changes to 100 different lines of CSS just for one particular color. You can save time by storing that color in a single variable that is then used everywhere else. And then whenever you want to actually change the color, you just have to change it in that one place and everywhere else that the variable is used, it will automatically be updated with that color and will save you a ton of time. This is one of the features that are making CSS preprocessors less useful. For the longest time, that was the only way that we could do variables inside of our CSS. That said, CSS preprocessors like Less, PostCSS, SAS, Stylus are still in use by a lot of projects. Some people like how they can be nested together and there are also special things that you can do like mix-ins and other special magic. So understanding what they are and why you would want to use one instead of plain CSS can be helpful. And most of the larger projects that I've worked on have used either SAS or less. That said, I personally prefer SAS, but sometimes we have to learn to do more with less. A lot of times you aren't even going to be writing your own CSS. There are plenty of CSS libraries out there like Tailwind CSS. And in the real world with projects, there's a good chance you're either gonna end up using a third party solution to help with your CSS, or you're gonna be using one that has been built in house by the company that you're working for. Now, you can't really know ahead of time what every company is using, but it is helpful to become familiar with using CSS libraries, and you can do that by learning something like Tailwind. Number three, JavaScript. And in a minute, we're gonna talk about JavaScript frameworks and much more. But in this video, I'm not going to deep dive into the specifics of the JavaScript programming language because it's a large enough topic that I've decided I'm gonna be making a separate JavaScript roadmap video. So subscribe if you wanna know when that comes out. And a video of the courses and resources that I recommend for learning front-end development is also on the way. For now, you should plan on getting really good at JavaScript if you want to be able to get into one of the higher paying front end developer positions because it is the programming language of the front end. You're gonna to wanna to know about the newer ECMAScript features, ES6, ES7, etc. Bleeding Edge is now at 12, but the big shift to newer syntax happened several years ago with ES6. This is why I don't share a lot of the courses and things that I actually used to study when I was first learning because a lot of them are now just out of date. Number four, JavaScript frameworks and libraries. But first, I gotta throw in the libraries disclaimer because without fail, some people cannot stand generalizations and will throw a tizzy fit if you say you're gonna be talking about frameworks and then you mention React.js. You know who you are, you should grab a soda and go chillax. Whatever you call them, there are three main technologies to choose from for building front-end web applications. I mean, there are more, but this is what you should focus on. Angular should not be confused with the original Angular JS, which you should avoid. It's what I learned on when I was first starting out, but the newer Angular is just much better. Angular is a full-fledged framework with most every utility you could want built in. Vue.js is a lightweight progressive framework that is kind of like a smaller version of Angular. It lets you add third-party libraries as needed, and it claims to be somewhere between a library and a framework, and that's about as confusing as a girl claiming to be your girlfriend and a stepsister at the same time. The third and best option is a small library for making awesome web and native applications React rocks. What can I say? I am 100% unashamedly biased on this one and you should be too. You see, Angular is highly opinionated, which means that there is a specific way to do most everything. So it's big and it's bloated. You wanted a banana and you got a gorilla holding the entire jungle too. On the other end of the spectrum is React, which is intentionally unopinionated. It provides some of the core functionality and you choose the rest, which makes it much more flexible. But this also means that you're gonna be learning some of the React related libraries, or you could just start with something like Create React App, Vite.js, Next.js, or one of the other similar projects as a way to get started without having to configure all of this yourself. React is in high demand, and it's what I have been using at work for the last several years at Adobe. And there's been this trend of things moving from Angular to React for quite a while now. That doesn't mean that Angular is dead. It's still a powerful framework, and a lot of people use it, most notably boomers. But there's one universal truth in software development, and that is that most everything is highly subjective. This 
this is no exception. All joking aside, if you're a new developer, then I highly encourage you to consider going for React. Unless you already have some strong existing connections to a possible job in a company that is using Angular, then it could definitely be worth it to learn Angular in order to get that job. And let me know if you want me to make a React roadmap video. Now we have to get some data. And for that, we make API requests. To do this in a React app, you're gonna either go with JavaScript's built-in fetch API, and then build wrappers around it yourself, or you'll end up using a library like Axios that already has those utilities and wrappers baked in. I like using Axios for my projects, but I'm sure that Fetch diehards are gonna chime in and tell us why Fetch is better than Axios, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, if you're working with Angular, a lot of this is already built in. So it's time to make something useful. So you're gonna need to interact with actual APIs. And to get started, you can build something that connects to an existing API. You probably have a YouTube account if you're watching this video, so maybe you look into creating a channel and uploading a video, and then you could use YouTube's APIs to interact with that video and the video analytics. Or if you don't wanna go there with interacting with that kind of API, then you might consider a solution like Firebase to handle the backend for you. And then that way you can connect the app to the Firebase, which is fairly easy to configure when compared to setting up a complete backend and having to deal with the database and everything else on your own. At this point, as you're either connecting to Firebase or to other APIs, you're gonna have the opportunity to learn some important things about security and protecting your data and authentication. But all of this doesn't mean that you should just go out and deep dive into backend development at this early stage in your career. And I talk more about this in another video where I share why you shouldn't become a full stack developer. And I'm gonna link to that at the end of this video. Number five, component libraries. Similar to CSS libraries, there are libraries for reusable components like buttons, drop-down menus, tables, and other cool widgets. In future projects, there's a good chance that you're going to be working with either a third-party component library or else you'll use internal ones built by your company. You might even be building components for that library. So it's a good idea to become familiar with how these work and it'll also help you to see good ways to create reusable components for when you're making your own components. Two of these that I really like is Angular Material, for Angular obviously, and for React apps, I like Semantic UI. Number six, some valuable tools that everybody should be using. In order to get this stuff all running, you're gonna end up needing to install Node.js and you're gonna need to learn how to use NPM, which is short for Node Package Manager. You use this to install and manage the different dependencies for your project. You also need a way to bundle your application for deployment. Now, if you're using tools like Create React App or Vue.js or Next.js, they're really gonna help with handling a lot of the more complicated configurations for you because they do this behind the scenes for setting up the dev servers and for actually bundling and building your code for production. You'll be able to go pretty far with what Create React App and Vue.js and Next.js provides out of the box, but as your project grows in complexity, you might end up actually having to learn how to configure web directly or some other bundler. In software development, it is super important to keep a history of all the changes that you've made to your code base that so you can go back and see when you introduced a bug, or maybe you don't like the features that you just made and you wanna be able to roll it back without having to remember every line of code that you changed. And you also want a way to protect your code from getting lost in case something bad happens like your laptop fails. So you should learn to use Git for version control and GitHub is a great place where you can store your project that uses Git. As you work with Git, you're gonna to wanna to learn how to create repos, create branches, push and pull from repos, merge branches, fork repos, and do pull requests into repos because these are some of the things that we do almost every day and some of them we do multiple times a day. You also need to learn Chrome DevTools. It is one of the most powerful ways to debug problems with your front end application. And there are also specific extensions you can get to help with debugging React or Angular, but DevTools should be one of your best friends. Number seven, deploying code. What is the point of building an application if you don't have any place to put it? Some options for hosting your application include Heroku, GitHub Pages, Firebase, AWS, Azure, and there's a bunch more, so just pick one to learn. Heroku or GitHub Pages is a good place to start. It would also be helpful to become familiar with Docker containers and how that ties into the deployment process. Number eight, things to learn later on. Once you're comfortable with building and deploying an application, it'll be worth your time to learn how to actually test your code. For JavaScript, I recommend that you learn Jest, and if you have some time, at least become familiar with some of the other forms of tests like Selenium or Cypress. I include these in the later section because it's probably not best to get swamped learning how to test 
early on is you're going to be fighting through a bunch of information overload already, but eventually you'll get to where you're actually writing tests as you're actually building features for the application. And now that you're comfortable with JavaScript, you might consider learning TypeScript. If you chose to go down the Angular path, TypeScript is already baked in, so you might already be learning it. But with React, the dev camp is still largely divided, so it's not mandatory, but it definitely could be really valuable for a lot of companies if you have TypeScript experience. Another thing to consider learning is accessibility, and you'll often see it referred to as A11Y, or some will just say Alley. And yes, those are ones and not the letter L's. Knowing how to make your application easy to use for people with disabilities is a valuable skill. I mean, imagine being colorblind and not being able to tell the difference between two options on a page, or perhaps you're blind and have to rely on a screen reader to tell you what is happening on that page. This is really important, especially at bigger companies, educational institutions, or companies that have government contracts. And now, if you wanna know why it's a horrible idea for beginners to focus on full stack development, you should watch this video or click the link in the description. Lates.